All right, shall we get started? Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanna thank everyone for making time to join us uh, for this briefing hosted by the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. I'm really thankful to see several of my colleagues already logged in and joining us this evening, uh, including my co-founder of the caucus, Jamie Raskin, uh, another original uh, co-founder, Jerry McNerney, uh, Susan Wild from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and I have been told from a bunch of other colleagues that they intend to join us this evening as well. Um, so look for them to pop in soon. Uh, let me thank the press that is joining us tonight. Uh, We're glad to have members of the media uh, on this Zoom call and hearing the important report that we will be uh, receiving and discussing. And uh, just to let everyone know, a little housekeeping, uh, we will be recording this program. So uh, let's everyone be on our very best behavior. Um, the way it's going to go, the run of show is uh, I'm going to make some very brief opening remarks. I'll then pass to my uh, co-founder, Jamie Raskin, for a few opening thoughts. And at that point, uh, we will introduce our speakers uh, who will moderate themselves for about 40 minutes. And uh, then we will bring it back to the members of Congress for questions. Uh, to, to uh, continue a dialogue with them. And we should wrap up a little over an hour from now in what I know is gonna be a great program. So uh, let's get started. As uh, I think many of you know, Congressman Raskin and I had this idea to create the Free Thought Caucus. Uh, back in 2018, uh, we wanted to promote public policy based on reason, science, and moral values. Of course, protecting the separation of church and state was one of our most important principles. Uh, but our mission really goes beyond that. We also work to oppose discrimination against both religious and non-religious people, and to put a spotlight on extremist ideology, which brings us to the focus of tonight's meeting. January 6th, 2021 was a tragic day for our country, a direct attack on our democracy. And many scholars, reporters, members of Congress have offered insights uh, of course, our colleague Jamie Raskin is on the, the select committee that is currently investigating the attack. But what has been missing um, in a lot of the narratives that you've heard about January 6th is what we're going to be discussing here tonight, the role of white Christian nationalism before and during the attack on the Capitol. White Christian nationalism is an insidious ideology that is contrary to the mainstream Christian beliefs. It attempts to fuse Christianity with a very authoritarian, racist, homophobic view of American civic life. It defines true Americans as being white, culturally conservative, natural-born Christians, and it specifically seeks to impose all of this on our government and our public policy. The role of uh, Christian nationalism in the January 6th insurrection is not just a concept or an afterthought. I think you're gonna to hear tonight just how central it was to what happened on January 6th. And the new report that we will hear about entitled Christian Nationalism in the January 6th, 2021 Insurrection is a thorough, comprehensive accounting of Christian nationalism's role in the insurrection. And it's a product of cooperation between both secular and Christian allies under the cause of standing against religious extremism. I'm very thankful to both organizations, uh, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and the Freedom From Religion Foundation uh, that are bringing this report to us this evening. I'm honored to introduce now our four speakers who uh, each will contribute, I guess have contributed chapters to the report, starting with Amanda Tyler, the Executive Director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. Also, Sam Perry, Dr. Sam Perry, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Jamar Tisby, a historian and author of Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. And finally, our friend Andrew Seidel, a constitutional attorney at the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the driving force behind this report. I wanna just emphasize that our event this evening is not anti-religion. Uh, in fact, we celebrate the Christians and those from all religions who have stood up for what is right. 
but we must recognize that Christian nationalism as an ideology is not a theoretical threat to our democracy and our republic. It is a clear and present danger, and I hope tonight uh, we will make progress towards uh, expanding that understanding to other people. January 6th and the ongoing violence and hatred fueled by Donald Trump is really just the tip of the iceberg. If we don't take a critical eye to what happened and the serious threat posed by white Christian nationalism, our democracy will face more challenges uh, and will be in, in true danger. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand off to uh, my great friend, Jamie Raskin, for his opening remarks, and then we will hand it to our panel. Jamie. Jerry, thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us in this uh, very important um, event for the Free Thought Caucus, which has stood strong against the authoritarianism and the fanaticism unleashed against us on January the 6th. Um, I want to thank the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and the Freedom from Religion Foundation for preparing this um, really exhaustive and fine-grained report on the role of white Christian nationalism um, and the insurrection that took place on January the 6th. I want to thank these great speakers who've come to join us, Amanda Tyler, uh, Dr. Samuel Perry, Dr. Jamar Tisby, and Andrew Seidel. Um, as the report observes, Christian nationalism is a political ideology and a cultural framework that seeks to merge American and Christian identities uh, resulting in, at least what some would argue, an authoritarian distortion of both the Christian faith and America's uh, traditional constitutional precepts. Um, I should uh, hasten to say that uh, white Christian nationalism was by no means um, the only ideological impulse present on January the 6th. It might not even have been the dominant one. There were lots of others present on that day, including uh, traditional uh, white supremacy, um, neo-Nazism, um, pro-Trumpism, various kinds of cultisms and authoritarianisms. Um, and yet uh, Christian nationalism was clearly figured highly in the events of the day. And we're going to figure out exactly what its role was. Uh, from this report, and it was certainly a unifying theme for many of the factions that assembled on January 6th. Um, more than a year later, Christian nationalists continue to join forces to try to challenge our democratic institutions and values, whether it's in the suppression of voting rights or the promotion of various um, culture war battles, including um, to my mind, the utterly fraudulent attack on critical race theory. Um, as my colleagues and I on the January 6th Select Committee continue our work to leave no stone unturned in the investigation, I'm grateful for many of the outside academics, journalists, and researchers who are working on the problem of January 6th, including those who put together this uh, excellent and eye-opening report uh, that I hasten to add what is probably obvious anyway, but I'm speaking here, of course, only for myself and not for um, that committee or any other. I look forward to our very robust conversation tonight. And now I will turn it over to Amanda uh, with the Baptist Joint Committee to kick things off. Well, and thank Amanda, you. before you get started, let me quickly acknowledge we've been joined by uh, Congressman Sean Caston of Illinois and Congressman Don Beyer of Virginia. Uh, members of Congress, I know you're going to have questions as we go along. Just use the raise hand feature, and then when Amanda and her colleagues are done with their presentation, uh, we'll try to get to everybody and begin the dialogue. Amanda, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Huffman and Congressman Raskin, for your leadership. And thanks to all of you for joining us today to discuss this important new report, Christian Nationalism in the January 6, 2021 Insurrection, released by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, along with the organization that I lead, the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, or BJC. BJC is an advocacy and education organization out of the Baptist tradition, and we are headquartered right there on Capitol Hill and work for faith, freedom for all. I was so honored to work on this report with Andrew Seidel and the team at Freedom From Religion Foundation to release this report. 
BJC and the Freedom From Religion Foundation are two organizations that are both committed to advocating for the importance of separating the institutions of religion and government as a necessary safeguard for protecting everyone's religious freedom, those who claim a faith tradition and those who do not. Both of our organizations view the rise of Christian nationalism which is a political ideology and cultural framework that seeks to merge the American and Christian identities as an urgent threat to this safeguard. The January 6, 2021 insurrection showed how in the hands of violent extremists, Christian nationalism can also turn deadly and threaten the continuation of our democracy itself. Even as someone who had been studying Christian nationalism for some time before the attack, I was shocked at the scale and severity of the insurrection and at just how dire the threat of Christian nationalism is to our constitutional democracy. From my personal perspective as a Christian, seeing signs of my faith on display filled me with anger and frustration. The attackers used Christianity as a kind of mascot, trying to lend credibility and social acceptability to their terrorism. And in the process, they sullied Christianity and the name of Jesus in the hearts and minds of people all over the world. Projects such as this report, which represents a broad and diverse coalition of Americans working together to understand Christian nationalism and call it out, are important. But necessary, too, is a strong response from American Christians and particularly white American Christians and predominantly white Christian institutions, which have contributed to and benefited from Christian nationalism in the culture. And one such example of an organized response that predates January 6th is the Christians Against Christian Nationalism Initiative. Launched in 2019 by BJC, and endorsed by an ecumenical group of Christian leaders, Christians Against Christian Nationalism is a grassroots collective of individuals who identify as Christian and are taking a public stand against Christian nationalism. As of today, nearly 25,000 individuals across the country from more than six dozen different denominations have publicly signed the statement. And you will find many of your constituents as signers of the statement. You can view all the public signers organized alphabetically by state at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. You know, the events of January 6th served as a wake up call for many Christians about just how destructive Christian nationalism can be, not just to American democracy, but to Christianity itself. And we at BJC and Christians Against Christian Nationalism have undoubtedly seen renewed interest in learning more about Christian nationalism and acquiring tools and resources to use with congregations and communities to have conversations about it. We have predictably also faced some defensive pushback and either willful or unintentional misunderstanding from some Christian audiences when we have called out Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism has become so embedded in some Christian communities that it can be hard to distinguish between the ideology of Christian nationalism and the religion of Christianity. But as Congressman Huffman said, to oppose Christian nationalism is not to oppose Christianity. In fact, many Christians, and I am one of them, see opposing Christian nationalism as key to preserving the faith. Let's be clear. Christianity does not and cannot unite Americans under a national identity. And as we learn more about Christian nationalism, how it debases Christianity, and how it threatens to destroy American democracy, we are even more convinced of the need for a national commitment from religious and secular groups and individuals to furthering the American ideal that our belonging in society is not in any way conditioned on or connected to our religious identity. The ideal of religious freedom for all, supported by the separation of the institutions of religion and government, can be a unifying force for all Americans 
regardless of religious beliefs. And so now I am going to turn it over. We'll hear some short presentations from some of the report's contributors about their sections of the report. First up is Dr. Samuel L. Perry. He is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Oklahoma. He's the co-author of Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States, what I view as the definitive scholarly work on Christian nationalism out today. And his contribution to this report, co-authored with Dr. Andrew Whitehead, is titled, What is Christian Nationalism? Thanks so much uh, for the time uh, and uh, for the opportunity to share some findings with you. Uh, for the past seven years, my co-authors who are all sociologists and I have been gathering data to try to understand the scope and impact of white Christian nationalism in particular uh, on Americans' values uh, and their political behavior and how they're in their interpretation of recent uh, events. Uh, Christian nationalism we define as an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of American civic life with a very particular kind of Christianity. Uh, that particular kind of Christianity uh, implies Christian culture, but not necessarily Christian understandings of neighborliness or self-sacrifice. Uh, what is really implied in phrases like Christian heritage or Christian values or Christian nation refers primarily to a white Christian social order um, characterized by uh, what, is, what is largely understood as partisanship, uh, conservative Christian uh, ideals of how to how to interpret uh, the Bible and relationships, uh, authoritarian hierarchies, uh, and as I'll get into uh, other other unfortunate and uh, I think negative and anti-democratic uh, kind of policy preferences and values. Over the past few years, we have demonstrated a number of important findings that I think lead us to understand uh, and frame what happened on January 6th and how to put that into proper perspective in Christian nationalism's role, not just what uh, it, not just uh, specifically what went down at the Capitol, but also how Americans have interpreted those events and how that could give rise to other such events in the future. First, uh, when we talk about Christian nationalism, I specify white Christian nationalism because we often find as we measure Christian nationalism, and uh, we talk about this in our report, we use a, a variety of indicators. We uh, ask Americans on various national surveys to affirm a number of statements, and these are statements that we believe indicate how strongly Americans affirm Christian nationalist ideology. For example, we ask them how much they agree with the statement like, the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation. It's a pretty explicit measure. Or the federal government should enforce a strict separation of church and state. We look at the reverse of that. People who disagree with that don't want a separation of church and state or the success of the United States as part of God's plan. Or uh, in other uh, more recent indicators, more recent surveys, we ask uh, whether they believe the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence is divinely inspired. So it's these kinds of associations that we make. So the more Americans affirm all of these questions, we add these up into a scale, and Americans who score higher on that scale would more strongly affirm Christian nationalism. And we like to think of Christian nationalism not as a clinical diagnosis, like you're a Christian nationalist, that's about as effective as calling somebody a fascist or not. It's not really a, a good policy or good practice in my mind. I usually think about uh, referring to somebody who agrees more or less with Christian nationalist ideology because it is more of a spectrum that people can agree uh, more or less with. So when we think about Christian nationalism, we like to specify white Christian nationalism because uh, Christian nationalist ideology seems to perform, or at least our measures seem to perform differently when white Americans affirm them as opposed to non-white Americans or racial minorities. And that is because Christian language uh, and Christian identity, uh, these patterns are racialized in the United States because of our structural location and our experiences. Let me give you an example. So when white Americans affirm our indicators of Christian nationalism, they seem it seems to evoke ideals of nostalgia for a time when good people like us, conservatives like us, people with our kinds of traditional values, held all the cultural power and held political influence. And so when they think of things like Christian nation, Christian heritage, and Christian values, and they read those kinds of answers, they think, people like me, we need to be in control, and, and that's what they want to affirm. That's what it's really associated with, xenophobia, uh, ethnocentrism, even authoritarianism. So we'll talk about that in a second. But when, say, African Americans affirm our, effort, our, our measures of Christian nationalism, they don't remember a time that it doesn't give them nostalgia for a time where people like us held all the cultural and political power. 
African Americans are read our questions about Christian nationalism, and they seem to, on surveys, it seems to uh, be more aspirational. It seems to, uh, the kinds of ideas that would hold America to accountability for, or hold America to account for values that it never quite lived out. And so uh, I, I want to stress that when we're talking about Christian nationalism, we are really primarily talking about white Christian nationalism, because those kinds of ideologies are most noxious and most pernicious when white Americans uh, hold them. Uh, secondly, Christian nationalist ideology, white Christian nationalist ideology should not be, and it's been said and it will be said again, should not be confused with Christianity proper. That's not to say that Christians can't be Christian nationalists. Uh, certainly there is tremendous overlap between Christian nationalism and people who identify as Christian, especially white evangelicals in the United States. But uh, it is an empirical fact that there are many Christians who do not affirm and in fact reject Christian nationalist ideology. Just And there is also, and this might surprise some, there are also a number of Americans who are not, who do not identify as Christian, who also affirm Christian nationalist ideology. In those situations, what we're looking at is we're looking at a, uh, we're looking at Americans who who really believe Christian is kind of an, an ethnic category at that point. They just uh, it's more pro-Christian, pro-Christian values, pro-conservatism, and so uh, these are, these could be secular Americans and Americans of non-Christian faith who believe that good old Christian values ought to hold sway and people like us ought to be in charge. Third. Christian nationalism, we find, is powerfully associated with authoritarian means of social control. Uh, we find on various surveys, one of, the, one of the strongest factors that would predict whether Americans believe uh, that police ought to be able to use any means necessary to subdue suspects, or that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, or that they would support the use of torture. White Christian nationalism is powerfully associated with that kind of ideology. And in fact, uh, and it should go without saying, every time I say something that white Christian nationalism is associated with some kind of outcome, what I'm really, what I'm really talking about is, is even after we control for various factors, so we're not just measuring political partisanship, we're not just measuring political ideology or education or region of the country, we're actually isolating the effect of Christian nationalism on various attitudes and behavior. Fourth, white Christian nationalism is associated with conspiratorial beliefs. Uh, especially the perception that white Americans and Christian Americans are being persecuted or being attacked. Uh, it's strongly associated with the belief that Donald Trump had the 2020 election stolen from him, but also including things like QAnon conspir conspiracies, anti-COVID uh, conspiracy theories, anti-vax conspiracies, and uh, lastly, or sorry, two more, uh, Christian nationalism is associated with anti-democratic values and intolerance. Uh, we find that Christian nationalism is one of the leading predictors, certainly, of xenophobia and ethnocentrism and racist ideologies, but we also find that it's associated with a belief that we make it too easy to vote already, that they would support hypothetical policies that, that would uh, limit voting to people who could pass a basic civics test, or they would uh, disenfranchise certain felons for life, uh, strongly believe in voter fraud is rampant, and that voter suppression is not a problem. So these are the things we're picking up in various surveys. The last thing I'd want to point out, and this is what, what I'll, I'll show you on a PowerPoint, Christian nationalism is powerfully associated with how Americans have interpreted and responded to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Think about all of the things I just mentioned so far. Christian nationalism associated with authoritarian means of social control, conspiracy theory, anti-democratic values. Uh, and it is, you can imagine how this ideology might give rise to the kind of radicalism or the kind of response that we would, we would see in uh, the kind of outbreak of violence, the kind of outbreak of anti-democratic practice that we saw on January 6th. Here's the thing that I think is a little bit more worrisome and I, I, that I think, I think we need to watch out for in the near future. So we gave Americans a survey in February, 2021. This was just after the Capitol insurrection, right after Joe Biden had been inaugurated. We asked Americans uh, whether they believe, they uh, to indicate various questions like whether they believe the protesters who stormed the Capitol should be caught and prosecuted, or whether they sided with the, those who stormed the Capitol. And uh, I just want to show you guys how Americans' attitudes, these are panel data, and so we are actually looking at the same Americans tracked over time. And so this is how Americans' attitudes changed and how this responds or corresponds to Christian values. Let me share my screen really quick. All right, so... What I've done is I have divided up my Christian nationalism scale into quartiles. The first quartile are those who score the lowest on Christian nationalism, who really reject that ideology. Those in the fourth quartile are those who score the highest on Christian nationalism. True believers, all right, what Andrew Whitehead and I call ambassadors of Christian nationalism. Now, we see this is February 2021, right after the insurrection. We saw that the, still the majority of Americans, oh, excuse me, 
The majority of Americans believe the protesters should be caught and prosecuted. Obviously, as Christian nationalism increases, that belief that protesters should be caught and prosecuted goes down. Here's something that's interesting, though. These are the same people we asked six months apart. We asked them in February, and then we asked them in August. Notice that for Americans who generally agree with Christian nationalism, the percentage who believe that protesters should be caught and prosecuted dropped by 20%. Right to almost 50 percent, they're almost 50-50 at that point. Right, this is uh, uh, over to over a matter of six months. The percentage that believe that protesters should be caught, prosecuted, actually diminished. Look at this one. This is the, the the percentage of Americans who said, "I actually stand with the protesters who stormed the Capitol." Now, in no group is this a majority of Americans. I don't mean to to give that impression. Uh, and yet, we see that as Americans affirm Christian nationalism, they're more likely to side with the protesters. This was in February, but look at this. Six months later, in, in August, when we interviewed the same people again, the percentage who said of the true believers, the percentage of the true believers uh, in Christian nationals, white Americans, uh, the percentage doubled, who, who, affirm, uh, who affirm that they stand on the side of the protesters. What is going on there? Well, I believe, or we believe, my co-authors and I believe that uh, over this time frame, uh, Christian nationalism, because of its connections to conspiracy theory, because of its connections to authoritarian control and us versus them ideology that believes that rightfully, you know, people like us rightfully uh, should run this country, that they actually are reinterpreting the events that took place at the Capitol in a more positive light, more likely to say, hey, you know what, those protesters had it right. Or, you know what, we, we should really back off those protesters because they may have been good Christian patriots just trying to do their duty. And I think this is where uh, we should really pay attention in the future. And I think we we uh, we we want to give attention to uh, all of the things associated with white Christian nationalism, the conspiratorial thinking, certainly, but also the authoritarian uh, views on social control, the anti-democratic attitudes, and how all of these things shape a potential reinterpretation of events that took place on January 6th. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Perry, for um, for your presentation, for those fascinating figures, and for um, talking about white Christian nationalism. You know, when we were talking about some of the pushback we get, sometimes we hear that you know when we're calling out Christian nationalism, we're just trying to push Christians out of the public square. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. In our in our statement, we say people of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square, and that is exactly what the contribution of our next author um, brings to the table. Um, we have next Dr. Jamar Tisby, uh, a historian of race and religion, and the author of *The Color of Compromise: The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism* and also how to fight racism. And his contribution to the report is titled The Patriotic Witness of Black Christians. Thank you, Amanda, and greetings to everyone. It's uh, an important day, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm a proud alumnus of the University of Notre Dame. So this is our holiday, y'all. This is a big deal, go Irish. Um, it's another important occasion today. You may not be aware, but it's the birthday of Merle Evers Williams. Merle Evers Williams. You may have heard of her. She is a civil rights activist in her own right, but she probably first came to prominence for a very tragic incident in which her husband, Medgar Evers, was assassinated. It was 1963. Medgar Evers was the first NAACP field secretary in Mississippi. He was coming home one night from an organizing meeting and across the street in the bushes was a man waiting with a gun. He took aim at Medgar Evers and shot him and killed him. The bullet ripped through his body, went through the wall of the house into the kitchen and lodged in the refrigerator door. Merle Evers and her children were inside. One of the striking facts about that incident is that Medgar Evers had a stack of sweatshirts in his hand, and on those sweatshirts was the phrase, Jim Crow must go. Of course, we remember Jim Crow as a segregationist cultural and legal movement, but it was also devoted and dedicated to disenfranchising Black voters. And so Medgar Evers had committed his life to the promotion of democracy and extending voting rights to all people. Ultimately, he died for democracy. 
What we should also know about both Medgar and Merle Evers is that they were dedicated Christians. And they saw it as a seamless application of their religious beliefs to work to extend voting rights, democracy, and civil rights for all people. So my contribution to the report is to say that in contrast to those who would cite uh, such concepts as, in contrast to those uh, such as white Christian nationalists, there were other witnesses to the faith who provided a different understanding of what it meant to work for both God and country. Now, what I have to say is simple. There are those who would cite such concepts as critical race theory as the real danger to democracy. But this report reveals that white Christian nationalism is the most th potent threat to democracy in the United States today. I think that assertion, bold as it may be, is backed up even by the Department of Homeland Security in their 2020 Homeland Threat Assessment they named domestic violent extremists as the biggest domestic threat to democracy and uh, the biggest terrorist threat. And they specifically pointed to white supremacist extremists, and they said it will remain, they will remain the most persistent and lethal threat in the homeland. White supremacist extremists have demonstrating a longstanding intent to target racial and religious minorities members of the LGBTQ plus community, politicians, and those they believe promote multiculturalism and globalization at the expense of the white supremacist extremist identity. Unfortunately, there is an overlap between white supremacist extremism and white Christian nationalism. A lot of times uh, these extremists would uh, use the veneer of religion, such as Christianity, to provide backing for their beliefs and actions. But in contrast to white Christian nationalism, black Christians have historically tended to embrace a kind of patriotism that leads to an expansion of democratic processes, the inclusion of marginalized people, and a call for the nation to live up to its foundational ideas. I'm a historian, so let me give you a few historical examples. Uh, there was a guy named Charles H. Pierce, and he was one of the ministers, one of the first ministers to bring the African Methodist Episcopal Church to Florida. And he was in a long line of Black Christians who understood it as part of their religious duty and application of their religious beliefs to work for the promotion of democracy. And he said this, a man in this state cannot do his whole duty as a minister, except if he but looks out for the political interests of his people. Now, in context, this would have meant looking out for the equal rights and civil rights of Black people and any others who were not included in a white Christian nationalist vision of what it meant to be a citizen. Let me give you one other example from the civil rights era. One of my historical heroes is Fannie Lou Hamer. She was born in 1917. She was the 20th of 20 children in Sunflower County, Mississippi. And from a certain perspective, she had everything going against her. She was poor, she was black, and she was a woman. And yet, she rose to national prominence as a civil rights leader working for voting rights and for the alleviation of poverty for both the poor black and white people of the Mississippi Delta. Her journey began in the church. She heard a presentation about voting rights at her church, William Chapel AME in Ruleville, Mississippi. Hamer's Christian faith taught her that all people were created equal in God's sight, so no one should be denied the right to vote or the opportunities of full civic participation based on race. And she often used the Bible to back her beliefs. She would point to passages such as Acts chapter 17, verse 26, God has made from one blood every nation of people to dwell on the face of the earth. So the idea that all people are equal and deserve equal rights. 
Then in 1964, she had a famous testimony at the Democratic National Convention. And she ended her remarks by saying, is this America? The land of the free and the home of the brave where we have to sleep with our telephone off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily, because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Hamer understood that her beliefs about the dignity of all people because of her religion should also extend into the civic sphere and the way we treat one another. And today the movement continues with black Christians such as Reverend Raphael Warnock in the Senate who serve in both the pulpit and the Congress as an integration of their Christian faith and their patriotic effort to form a more perfect union. And so what does all of this mean? Three things. First, let us distinguish between white Christian nationalism and the patriotic witness of other Christians, such as Black Christians. Just because it's Christian or religious doesn't necessarily lead to the denial of democracy or the attempt to overthrow it. On the contrary, we should point to the historic Black Christian tradition as an animating force for democracy throughout this nation's past. Second, let us count the majority of Black Christians as allies in the fight against white Christian nationalism and for a more inclusive society. And so this means that people of faith should be invited and included in endeavors to prevent the negative effects of an unhealthy conflation between church and state. And then thirdly, let us equip people of faith with tools like this report and uh, the resources from Christians Against Christian Nationalism to identify white Christian nationalism in the church and our politics, to equip faith communities to, to root out Christian nationalism from their midst and to provoke, promote a, a uh, religious, uh, the rights and privileges of all people. But I end with this. It won't be easy. The one time I personally interacted with Merle Evers was at the grand opening of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum in Jackson, Mississippi. This was December 2017. She was in a closed meeting with the press and other influencers and I was present there. One person asked her, how does this era that we're in now compare to the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s? Now, mind you, that was the era in which her husband was assassinated. So one would think that the difficulties we face now couldn't compare with what she faced then, but this is what she said. I see something today that I hoped I would never see again. That is prejudice, hatred, negativism that comes from the highest points across America. She went on, she said, I, and I found myself asking Medgar, in the conversations that I have with him, is this really what's happening again in this country? And asking for guidance because she didn't mind admitting this. She said, I'm a little weary at this point. She's 89 years old. And she said though, if I have to fight for the future of this country, my children and others, I will do it. Folks, Merle Evers Williams has earned her rest from defending democracy. She should be enjoying her children and her grandchildren. And instead she feels the call to once again fight for the soul of this nation. I hope that with this information about white Christian nationalism and the goodwill we have among the people assembled here today, that she won't have to fight alone. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Dr. Tisby, for those sobering and inspiring words and for your patriotic witness and for sharing these stories from history with us as well. Um, so finally, our, our last presentation tonight is from Andrew Seidel, a constitutional attorney at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He's the author of The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American and his forthcoming book, American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, Andrew is the principal organizer and driving force behind this report. And he has written two sections of the report, 
the events, people, and networks leading up to January 6th and attack on the Capitol, evidence of the role of white Christian nationalism. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, I was gonna say, share some photos and videos tonight, but I'm afraid my internet is not gonna let me do that. We're having some thunderstorms here in Representative Pocan's district. Uh, so you can either take the weather up with him, I believe he's on this call somewhere, uh, and, or, and I would encourage you to do this instead, you can dig into the report itself and you can see the photos there. Anthony is gonna put a link in the chat for everybody. Uh, everything I'm about to tell you is backed up and as one journalist recently put it, lavishly footnoted in the report, the evidence doesn't lie. And I'd like you to think about Christian nationalism as a permission structure that gave the insurrectionists the moral and mental license they needed to attack our government and attempt to overturn a free and fair election. And the evidence for that is overwhelming, indisputable and clear and lavishly footnoted. The, the attackers told us loudly and repeatedly what they believed and why it justified the attack. They told us about their Christian nationalism and we really ought to listen to them. Because if we ignore the ideology that justified this attack in their own minds, we are inviting future attacks. Because Christian nationalism is an existential threat to the American Republic. Christian nationalists held dry runs between election day and the attack itself, including the Million MAGA March on November 14th, the Jericho March's Let the Church Roar event on December 12th, the Women for America First rally also on December 12th, and the One Nation Under God prayer rally at the Supreme Court on January 5th. They believed and openly claimed that they were doing the quote, will of God. The crowds waved the same Christian flags and signs that were ubiquitous during the attack. The same speakers, including Roger Stone and Alex Jones and Mike Lindell and Ali Alexander who founded Stop the Steal and Michael Flynn appeared at these rallies, preaching ever more belligerent messages. The unifying theme across all of the events and speakers and crowds was Christian nationalism. The Million MAGA March on November 14th began with a prayer, a prayer that was infused with Christian nationalism, like claiming that America is founded, quote, on Judeo-Christian principles. And that prayer set the tone for everything that happened later. The Proud Boys attended the rally, knelt in prayer, and then later rampaged through the city burning and stabbing. And these dry runs continued right up until January 6th. And one example in the report that we include is the Jericho March. And this is a group that was founded by two federal workers who were sent visions from God to, quote, let the church roar. And the Battle of Jericho in the Bible is a genocide. In the story, the biblical God orders his followers to march around the city of Jericho while blowing shofars, ram's horns, and then to violently sack the city and murder every living thing in it, including the animals. So the Jericho March baptized itself after this event and then organized events that reenacted this story of slaughter. They marched around government buildings in state capitals and in DC, including the Capitol building and the Supreme Court building, blowing shofars and claiming to know God's will. How can we possibly have been surprised by the violence knowing that? The Jericho March organized the Let the Church Roar event on December 12th with also Stop the Steal. It included an exorcism, speeches by bishops, oath keepers, cardinals, former members of Congress, former members of the military. The language preached that day was openly militant. Uh, for instance, the Reverend Kez Kevin Jessup preached, quote, this is a Judeo-Christian nation and that he wanted to, quote, mobilize God's men made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, please read more in the report because you'll see that this, this is a sermon of Christian conquest framed in militaristic terms. Warrior, battle cry, mobilization, secret weapon, enlistment, strategic, prisoners of war, glory, deployed in battle, in hostile territory, under enemy occupation, commissioned as special forces, stationed, the final mission to ending this high treason. It was, it was literally a call to arms. He preached of, quote, the warrior mandate, a battle cry, a call to arms. One lower level Jericho March coordinator, uh, who also happens to be the director of the National Day of Prayer Task Force for Missouri, hammered the podium repeatedly with a gavel while the crowd chanted, no king but Jesus. She thanked God for giving them weapons of warfare 
and finished, let this be one nation under God in Jesus's name, amen. Al Lee Alexander, founder of Stop the Steal, talked about shutting DC down because, quote, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He ended his speech, we have God's favor, to God be the glory for God and country. When Stuart Rhodes, uh, the founder of the Oath Keepers, who was just recently charged with seditious conspiracy, took the stage at the Jericho March to call for a, quote, bloody war before Trump was out of office, he was cheered. Eric Metaxas, uh, a popular radio host and author and one of the most outspoken intellectual Zambonis for Christian nationalism, you know, he's out there working to put a respectable face on this exclusionary ideology, was the MC that day. And when Rhodes finished preaching bloody war, Metaxas said, oh, God bless you. This guy's keeping it real, folks. And it wasn't, it wasn't just imagery and rhetoric, the flags and the signs. It was a devout belief that this is a Christian nation, that God chose Donald Trump, and that God is on their side. The speaker, or <clears throat> excuse me, the attacker who kicked in Speaker Pelosi's door, hoping that the crowd would tear her into little pieces, as he put it, was quoted in one of his hearings as saying this, God is on Trump's side. God is not on the Democrats, <clears throat> is not on the Democrat side. And if patriots have to kill 60 million of these communists, it is God's will. The attackers believe that this is their country, given to them by their God, that they are acting on his orders and defending his chosen one. And when reality collides with a belief system like that, violence is inevitable. And that's what happened on January 6th. So if you remember, Paula White began that day with a prayer at the rally. And in true Christian nationalist fashion, she added the United States of America to the Lord's prayer that is written in Matthew chapter six. So she added America to a prayer that according to the Bible itself, Jesus himself prescribed and crafted. And you remember what happened when Trump called on the crowd to march to the Capitol. He ended with a Christian nationalist flourish that many people don't actually recognize as a Christian nationalist flourish, but has a fascinating history. You have to check out the report to know what I'm talking about. Impromptu worship concerts broke out on the short walk to the Capitol. On their march to the Capitol, the Proud Boys were hailed as, quote, God's warriors. And they knelt in prayer that was full of just this typical Christian nationalist rhetoric about restoring the nation. They marched and then they attacked. One attacker carried a Christian flag onto the floor of the Senate, then rifled through the senator's desks. Uh, to my knowledge, he has still not been identified, let alone arrested or charged. The self-proclaimed QAnon shaman led a prayer in the Senate about patriotism and Jesus and restoring the nation, ended that prayer in Jesus's name. One of the praying insurrectionists gave an interview later and he talked about that prayer in the Senate. And he said of the Senate, quote, we consecrated it to Jesus. That to me was the ultimate statement of where we are in this movement. And he's not wrong. A third praying insurrectionist posted a video saying, quote, I just wanted to get inside the building so I could plead the blood of Jesus over it. That was my goal. And then he spends 40 minutes recounting every action he took, all of it, he believed, directed by God. Another insurrectionist sipping a post-assault beer told her social media followers why she attacked the beating heart of American democracy. And this is what she said. To me, God and country are tied. To me, they're one and the same. We are founded as a Christian country and we see how far we've come from that. We are a godly country and we are founded on godly principles. And the idea that we are a Christian country and have slipped from those founding principles is a central tenet of Christian nationalism. <clears throat> And the imagery from that day is now infamous. But I think a lot of people fail to realize that nearly all of it has a tie to Christian nationalism. And sometimes it's obvious, like the, the huge wooden cross around which people worshiped and prayed while draped in Trump flags. Sometimes you have to look a little bit deeper to see the Christian nationalism. For instance, everybody recalls the gallows from which they wanted to hang our elected officials, but most people don't realize that they signed the gallows as if it were a yearbook writing, hang them high, and in God we trust, and God bless the USA, and amen. And as we make clear in the report, all, all of the disturbingly iconic imagery from that day has ties to Christian nationalism. 
including Zip Tie Guy and the Confederate flag and the splinter mob that Officer Eugene Goodman lured away from lawmakers. The flags and signs were clear. Jesus is my savior. Trump is my president. One nation under God. In God we trust. Jesus saves. Jesus 2020. Bible verses and crosses were omnipresent. One sign simply said, I am on your side, God. There were Catholic images of Jesus or Mary on banners, paintings, full-size framed paintings, and statues, some borne atop poles over the attackers' heads. A Bible was seen raised above the crowd like it was a Napoleonic eagle as the mob surged through one of the entrances, and again in the rotunda itself. In the rotunda, they sang the battle hymn of the Republic, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. They prayed in the rotunda. One of the people who entered the Capitol was a Catholic priest who admitted on camera to exercising a demon named Baphomet from the building. Now, there were, of course, as Representative Raskin mentioned at the outset, other motivations and drivers of this attack. But this Christian nationalist permission structure, doing God's will, fighting for God's law, returning the country to its Christian roots, pervaded a lot of those other obvious drivers of this attack. And this is one of the points that uh, my co-contributors, Andrew Whitehead and Sam Perry, make so well in their section and in their book. These groups united under the banner of Christian nationalism. Thank you, Andrew. Well, I, That's probably a good place to uh, good place to to keep us on track by moving to the members' questions, if that's okay. Um, sure. I, see, I see some have already popped in. Fantastic report uh, to all of you. Uh, let's begin uh, with my colleague Jerry McNerney. Well, uh, thanks, um, thanks, Jared. I think the the Freedom for Religion Foundation and the uh, the, the Bible Joint Committee, uh, the the uh, Baptist Joint Committee. Uh, sobering, uh, sobering information. Um, I look at it uh, like a, a, Venn, a Venn diagram. You have a circle with um, Christians, and you have a Christian in the middle with Christian nationalists, and you have on the other side uh, non-believers. Who uh, and there's an overlap between the two outside uh, circles in the middle circle. Um, so. Uh, I don't think there's an overlap between the non-believers and the Christians, but that could be as well. I don't understand, but there must be some fundamental uh, core uh, that those folks are, are that unify all these folks together. Um, and I don't think it's belief in Jesus, but it might be. Uh, could someone kind of just enlighten me of what the core is? Is, is it a, a, a racist core or uh, I think you mentioned uh, nostalgia. There must be some fundamental core to this thing. I'll I'll, uh, I'll jump on that. I I, I think I, what we understand it, and we've been you know crunching numbers for the last seven years on this and trying to collect as much data as we possibly can. I think I would describe it. Uh, so it, it it's 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 a uh, Andrew. My colleague Andrew Whitehead calls it a cultural framework. I I, I like to think of it as an ethno culture. So like what, and so this blends the idea of kind of an ethnic identity, this is the white part of it, but also ethnic implies also a part of culture. So it's an ethno culture. Religion is a part of this, but also an understanding of white, not necessarily white race, but, but whiteness, right? Like this, this, uh, this uh, a, a, a combination of, of, of perceptions of, of who the nation rightfully belongs to. People like us, and by people like us, I mean the ethno culture, the white Christian conservative, uh, traditional, almost certainly native born. Uh, and uh, this comes along with various other, you know, associated ideologies. But I think that's what well, that is the core, right? Like this white Christian ethno culture that unites both the, the non Christians who would affirm Christian nationalism because Christian at that point is really like, again, part of the ethno culture and the, the, uh, and, and it, of course, unites the Christians on this side who just for, for them who, you know, this is also a part of, it could be God and country Christian nationalism, but mostly it's, I think it's conceptions of who the nation rightfully belongs to. And thus you, you, you see they're willing to go to any lengths to, to try to make sure that the country stays in the right hand. Uh, and they feel like that's been taken away from them. 
Thank you. Let's go to uh, my colleague, Sean Caston from Illinois. And I'll just quickly acknowledge that we're, we've also been joined by Mark Pocan from Wisconsin and Hank Johnson from Georgia. Uh, Sean, you're up. Thanks, Jared. And I'm, and I'm glad that Mark is here so we can blame him for the weather. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, Dr. Tisby, I really enjoyed your comments. And I wonder if you'd expand a little bit. Your, um, it, it's always seemed to me maybe inaccurately that the, the fusion of, of Christianity and our constitution comes out of, comes out of black America. And, and way beyond the civil the civil rights era for all the reason you, the reasons that you mentioned you know I, I mean how much of Lincoln's speeches comes out of things that Frederick Douglass put in his head and and you know and I, I find my, I found myself as you were speaking thinking of that what was that line of Douglass's about the the slave auctioner's bell and the church bell chiming in with each other and the cries of the broken-hearted slave being drowned out by the religious pieties of his master something like that um, I wonder if you'd give us a little bit of historical context, how much of white Christian nationalism is essentially a reactionary response to black Christian nationalism? Does, does the first, does the second exist without the first and do I have that sequence right? Great question. Um, the chicken or the egg, that's, that's always the issue. Uh, what I can say is that uh, white Christian nationalism and uh, conceptions of patriotism coming out of the black Christian tradition exist in a dialectic. They're, they're constantly sort of um, moving uh, back and forth with or against each other. And so um, what you saw was the people who are the objects of oppression can very quickly point out the hypocrisy among the oppressors. And so this goes all the way back to at least the revolutionary era. When freedom was in the air, uh, there is a portion in the report that I give that talks about uh, a group of enslaved men wrote to the Massachusetts General Assembly, and they were petitioning them for freedom. And um, they were saying, hey, just like you are advocating for freedom from England, we're advocating for freedom um, from enslavement. And they were trying to use these patriotic conceptions of independence and liberty in defense of their own civil rights. Further along, um, Frederick Douglass, as you mentioned, it, it, he has that famous speech in 1852, uh, the meaning of the 4th of July to the Negro. What, what's so interesting in that very long speech is he gives a nod to the founding fathers and speaks of them relatively positively. He says, um, the point at which I'm compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable. So he was saying, well, they had the opportunity to emancipate black people, but they didn't. But then he goes on to say, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. He calls them statesmen, patriots, heroes. But then he says, with them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. So to get back to your question, there is, there tends to be the loudest voice and the dominant strain is something like white Christian nationalism. But there's always an antiphonal voice among the oppressed and the marginalized, in this case, black Christians that are conceiving of loyalty to nation in very different ways and understanding the role of faith and religion in relation to their role as citizens of a country in very different ways. And so what I'm hoping is that the, the members assembled here would understand that religious expression doesn't always lead to the denial of democracy, but can lead to its expansion. Thank you, fascinating. Let's go to my colleague who's responsible for bad weather, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mark Pocan. <laughs> oh, now you sound like Nancy Pelosi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after the last week. Um, hey, thanks to the, the groups uh, who put this together, especially Freedom From Religion Foundation. Uh, Wisconsin Second District is very proud to be the home uh, of that great national organization. Um, so this is taking this maybe a step forward to about a year later now. I, I've noticed, and it seems to be across the country, but I certainly noticed it back in Dane County, um, you know, our home in the district, 
there's a lot of school board races, like an explosion of school board races. Now, some of this is COVID, but as you mentioned, there seems to be this as part of this white Christian nationalist um, base. Have you looked at all at that? Because I haven't had a chance to see the candidates in every district, but there clearly was this very large number of candidates in multiple areas with primaries that seemed to come from what could appear to be this background. And if so, what does that mean? Because now they're running for office and they're kind of understanding that that may be the next step. I was just curious if you've had a chance to look at that. I, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, we, we have been investigating that and we're gonna probably send some testimony to Representative Raskin's uh, committee. On that point there, right after the attack, it seemed in general, and I think this is what Dr. Perry's um, awesome charts showed us is there, there was a little bit of, um, there was a moment of shame, I guess we could say. And since then, um, they've adopted the insurrection and seem emboldened by it. Um, a lot of the people who we were looking at as individuals, state and local officials who took part in the attack or were at the Capitol or were at the rallies um, are also now running for higher office in a couple of cases. Um, so they, they don't seem to be slowing down at all. And we do know, as you pointed out, Representative Pocan, that there's a, this groundswell to push the next wave to run for those lower public offices. And then, you know, eventually they'll, they'll work their way up. It's, it's something that we are very, very worried about and looking into. Um, hoping to raise the alarm on this first um, and then start talking about that more as well. And I would just add, we, I mean, we have not at Baptist Joint Committee done a study about school boards in particular, but have certainly noticed the same trend. And it's not surprising because often we see white Christian nationalism show up over fights about religion in the public schools and about how that, you know, what the proper role is. And there's a lot of coded Christian nationalism language, including in legislative measures like from Project Blitz, right, to, to actively put more um, de not devotional type of religion in the public schools. So it's not surprising that we'd see that in the school board races. Thank you. Let's go to what uh, Don Byer of Virginia. I feel I should yield to Stacy. She's been waiting so long. No, okay. Well, um, this is probably a naive question, but is it how do we differentiate Christian nationalism from the religious extremism we see in so many other places? You know, ISIS, Boko Haram, the the Jews in the settlements in in Palestine. Um, and, or is it even important to differentiate it? And how much of it's based on religion versus, you know, culture, politics, nostalgia? And then just the throwaway question is, is there any way of pointing out how little um, Christian teaching theology action shows up in Christian nationalism? That's right. Yeah, so those are, those are, those are great questions. So, uh, Chris, I think, I believe white Christian nationalism that we are seeing is, in some ways, a, a part of a broader global populist moment of like we see the rise of authoritarian regimes in all kinds of nations and they are often connected to religion uh, and and religion as a, as a as a cultural pivot or an identity to unite a group and nostalgia is associated with it this kind of traditionalist uh, or an, you might call it an ethno traditionalism a desire to go back to a time where the right people were in charge and the right kind of cultural values held sway White Christian nationalism is an American manifestation of that, and, and, and it's unique in so many other, I mean, so many ways because of our unique religious history. Uh, it, it has traditionally been in the, in the American uh, way, I mean, the American kind of manifestation of this, it has traditionally been couched in evangelical rhetoric. Uh, that is changing now, uh, post-Trump. Uh, or with Trump and, and afterwards, like I think Trump's very existence and his association with Christian nationalism has really really pulled back the curtain on, on what this is really all about. It's, it's really difficult to make an argument that your values voters when you, when you promote Trumpism and everything associated with that. And now I think it is, it is revealed that, that it, is, it is more obviously about uh, ethnic and cultural power uh, and, and a desire to maintain power when you feel like you are under attack and your kind of 
rightful rulership has been uh, stripped from you. And I think that's what we're, that's what we're seeing globally. It's certainly really what we're seeing in the American context. But I believe the uh, I believe the, the 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 explicitly Christian parts of this are being uh, I think stripped away as and, and like you said, uh, 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 Don. I think you've got this situation where um, it is it is obviously less and less concerned with neighborliness or sacrifice or anything resembling Christ likeness or anything Christian in terms of character and more about Christian as a culture, Christian as a value system, as a social order that we want to establish. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. You will not replace us. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right, well said. It's not you. It's Jamie, did you have a question? Because I have sort of a, a final cleanup question that I intended to pose at the very end. Yeah, I was gonna go for the final cleanup question myself, but um, uh, let's see. Um, I guess I would pose this one. Um, you know, the the most shocking thing about what took place on January six was the medieval style of violence that was unleashed on our officers, 150 of whom ended up bloodied and injured and wounded and hospitalized. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, to, to what extent there are actually explicit uh, ideological exponents of violence within the ranks of the white Christian nationalist leadership. Did it just happen, or is this something that's written and spoken about? I, I think they speak about it pretty openly, uh, and this is something that we really try to explore in, uh, I think especially the section of the report talking about the lead up to January 6th, the language that they use is very militant. Um, and they, they walk a fine line, uh, but, you know, of stochastic terrorism, basically, right? They're, they're trying to say just as much as they can, so that everybody out there listening understands um, what they are asking for. And they, they often put it in terms of spiritual warfare. Um, so that they have kind of this, this credible way to deny that they're calling for actual warfare. But if you listen to what they're saying, I mean, they are preaching war. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, so I think if you go look in the report, you'll see we, we lay that out pretty clearly. And uh, I've, not, I've not seen that done elsewhere, but it, it, it was very, it's alarming to watch. I spent a, too much time watching photo and video of, the, of the lead up uh, to everything that happened before January 6th. And it, it was it was really shocking. Great. And over to you, Jared. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say, go ahead. Yeah. Historically speaking, um, there's always been explicit or implicit use of violence to enforce this vision of a white Christian nationalist America. So, and, and it doesn't take the explicit instructions. Uh, for instance, uh, Theodore Bilbo, who was a senator in, in the Jim Crow era, said the best way to keep Black people, he used the N word, from voting was the night before. Wow. So that's yeah. been uh, the, the pattern throughout US history. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, thanks to all of our presenters for just an excellent conversation, an excellent report, uh, which Anthony has posted the link to in, in the chat box. And I'm glad that we have recorded this program tonight because I think both the report and the um, further uh, expansion on that report that we received tonight is something that we want to spread far and wide. People need to hear this, they need to understand it. So I wanna just close by asking each of our panelists what they believe is the one thing that members of Congress need to take away uh, from this research and this report that you have done as we think about uh, our ongoing challenge of protecting our democracy. I'm happy to go first on that. Um, I, the one thing I would like you to take away is that I think, I think we can beat Christian nationalism. I think we can relegate it back to the fringe. But I think that means, above all, a national recommitment to the separation of state and church. And I think that must begin with you.
I think that means public officials honoring that separation as one of America's founding ideals, one of the truly unique contributions of our constitution, not only to political science, but to all humanity. I think that means understanding that there is no freedom of religion without a government that is free from religion. So that's the thing that I would really love to see come out of this. We can, we can win on this fight, but it really does mean recommitting to that founding American value. Thank you. Jamar, did you want to go next? I would really love to see a coalition of the religious willing to spread this information and this truth telling because the unfortunately certain types of churches are the petri dishes in which white christian nationalism grows and whether you claim an organized religion or, or no religion at all if we do want to defeat christian nationalism and i'm with andrew that we can then we have to involve religious communities and christian communities in particular Great. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, uh, Andrew and, and Dr. Tisby have, have uh, said it really well. I, I, would, I would only add that I think, um, uh, I, just like I, I think I want to renew, a, a, renew a, a commitment to separation of church and state in, in the United States, I, I also want to challenge Christian communities to, to not be less Christian, but be more Christian. I mean, I really, I like, I feel like just like Dr. Tisby was saying in his, in his message, I feel like, um, uh, I believe, uh, authentic, uh, and, and, uh, you know, civic minded and neighborly Christian communities, uh, are, are make this country really great. And I, I, I want to double down on, on, not a, what we what we need isn't those folks to be less Christian. What we need them to be is authentically Christian. And I think those kinds of positive ways that we would like to see that are constructive and pro-social. And I think that would actually uh, be remarkable. And I think that would actually help uh, Christian nationalists, white Christian nationalism, feel more like, hey, this is not a place for you anymore. This is this is uh, this is something that is not welcoming to that that kind of ideology or tactic. All right, Amanda, you get the final word. Uh, you, you started us off and, and we'll let you bring it home here. Well, two quick things. You know, one, I agree with all of the panelists. The, the best antidote to the poison of Christian nationalism is a national recommitment to the principles of religious freedom for everyone. And to explicitly use that language of religious freedom, which has been co-opted, as, uh, as a term that really is most like most usually used now when it should be white Christian nationalism. So use that term of religious freedom for all. Um, and second, use the resources at Christians against Christian nationalism. You know, it's an open source place, both for Christians who want to sign, but for everyone to be able to point to here, look, it's not against Christianity to be against Christian nationalism, and just would invite you all to explore those resources more. Excellent. Well, thanks again to all of you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you next time. Have a good night. <laughs>